Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jane Friedman, and welcome to today's class on Mastering Amazon Data to Sell More Books with Alex Newton of Klytics. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Alex Newton of Klytics. Um, before founding Klytics, Alex spent 20 years in top management consulting for Fortune 500 companies. His mission is to make big data insights accessible and easy to understand for writers and for publishers and to help them make better and faster decisions on book projects and marketing. And I invited Alex to present this session because I've recently become much more familiar with what Klytics offers. And in fact, I've begun reporting out some highlights from Klytics reports in my newsletter, The Hot Sheet. And it's just so valuable. Um, I don't, you know, this is a free session. Um, Klytics is a paid service, but this is not an affiliate session. We're not here to like give you a hard sell. Um, although we'll tell you more about that service at the end of today's class. Um, I just think you can all really benefit from the data he has to offer you. And I think you're really going to enjoy the insights he's going to share today. So Alex, I'm going to hand it over to you and I won't jump in unless I see a burning question that I just have to ask you. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and hello everybody who's live on this session or later watching the replay. Thanks for this invite. It's a pleasure and honor to present some of the data we have to you. The title of today's session, really mastering the data to help you with your writing efforts, with your publishing efforts. If you're traditionally published, this will apply to you, how to make better book proposals, you know, using data perhaps that even your publishers don't have. If you're a hybrid, it will apply anyway. And to those of you who are just out there independently publishing, you will see a lot of things that will help you with some tactical things in your marketing. But for the whole audience, we also want to start more with a, almost like with a helicopter perspective, very briefly to then get more and more tactical. We will cover some of the basics as well as some of the more advanced tactics that you may want to use in marketing your book. Now, before we jump into this subject of data and don't shy away, I'm going to make it very, very palatable, I hope. There is one concept I'd like to convey that brings context to all what you can do with data. In this case, the book industry, the book market. Now, book success, I think there is a myriad of podcasts and webinars and academic dissertation on what makes book success. I, I'm going to throw in my little concept into the equation because the magic happens, obviously, when there is this connection between the left-hand side, at least on my screen, the author writing a great book and that making its way somehow to the reader. And what seems to be so simple in reality, all, we all know is, well, even if you address the individual reader in your writing, in your craft, which you probably should do, you know, really writing the story for that reader you have in front of your mind, then the sum of readers make up a market or a, a audience in a genre. And from there, if you want to connect your book with that market and or this genre, a lot of mechanical things have to fall in place to ensure book success, starting from the title descriptions, covers the mechanics of keywords and categories that we're also going to cover today, reviews, campaigns, newsletters, you name it. And each and every element of this can be informed with data. And before the book even is written, that's where I thoroughly believe that success can even start there. I come from the corporate world, you know, where action happens, but it is sometimes carefully planned. And I'd say before Coca-Cola launches a new flavor, I'd say they make sure that they've done some market research, whether people, whether the flavor is going to resonate with a potential buyer. The same here, you as an author, you start with this great creative process, you have a great idea. Then there is research and some planning, hopefully going into it. And what I cannot bring to you, what you bring to the table is this craft, knowledge, and passion for whatever you want to write. And hopefully the output is a great book. And what we're going to look at today is all these mechanical cogwheels. And I consciously 
drew cogwheels here because there is this mechanical element, despite all creativity, there are these mechanical factors that have to fall into place to make that magic connection. And we're gonna use some samples of the Kalytics data and show you how this data, primarily, primarily based on Amazon data, helps to make that connection. Now, when we do so, you can work with just alone, or you can work with author groups. You may be part of Facebook groups. You can work with author friends, book clubs, uh, writing clubs, you name it, or do great courses. And they are all valid and you should do so. What I'd like to do in today's session is add one other dimension to it. That is not just the insights from and opinions from a couple of friends or writing colleagues, or publisher colleagues for that matter, but insights from working with thousands and thousands of books. I've been working with books now. Uh, I started in publishing like 30 years ago almost, then spent my time in the corporate world across industries. And now six years ago, have come back tracking the market, the Amazon market. And what you see here is now insights from thousands and thousands of books crunching the number of those why. So simply that you don't have to. And in that, my mission has always been a bit bringing arts and science together. I play the guitar myself, so I'm a bit of an artist. And I've been a consultant and data person all my life, basically. And I think great things can happen when art meets science. And perhaps we can do a little bit of that magic in today's training. So the main goal today is that you walk out of this webinar and later replay with some know-how on how to use Amazon data to basically do the following. Focus your efforts, because that means it saves you time, money, and probably the most precious resource you have, which is your creativity and the time you spend with your creativity. And in the, <clears throat> in the end, obviously, to hopefully also sell more books in the process. So let's start with this first thing. I call it chapter one, market forces and spotting market trends. Now, I personally, this is not a picture of mine when I was young, but my early experience with market forces was one of these things on the left here. And, or more precisely, the lack of them, because I didn't have one of these gadgets here on the left-hand side. That's the Rubik Cube. I think one of the highest selling toys that were ever created. And my experience with the market force was, well, everybody wanted this thing, but my mother and I traveled from one toy shop to the other and nowhere was it available. And that was my first realization that there is a law of supply and demand and that you're better on the, on the right side of the equation. In this case, there was so much demand, but not enough supply. And that's probably also the ideal book market. You can conceive that now in the ebook world, supply is not that big of a problem, but that ideally you serve a market that you know, is very high in demand, hopefully not overly crowded with hundreds of manufacturers of Rubik's cubes or books in that, in, in that context. And hopefully that you're also on what I call a wave. Now, the first thing you need to realize about the book market, what you have in the overall economy, is also happening in the book market. It's happening in individual genres. And you have to just realize that market forces are at work in genres and their submarkets. For example, here on the left-hand side, this is Google search volume for the exact match term cozy mystery over the last 10 years. And you see it's been going up and up and up, obviously with all these oscillations, fluctuations, but the trend is clearly up. While like a big mainstream, genre the you know for the Grisham fans amongst you that's what I got me into legal thrillers back in the days well it's been flat you know throughout those years so you see these things are at work also in the book market sometimes it can even get a little more complicated in your decision making because there may be things such as paranormal romance here on the left hand side of this graphic where the search interest, again, this is a long-term endeavor here with a 10-year graph on the left-hand side. It all peaked you know, after 
vampire romance and the Twilight Saga. And then there was a decline all the way up to the pandemic. But the long term has been a very clear decline. Now, if you operate in that market, you look at this and say, hmm, that's not a good wave to be on unless you're surfing and want to have something here behind you. But the the point is there were sub sub markets like shifter romance, although here shown on a different scale, but from a trend perspective where the interest has been on the rise almost for a 10 year period. So you get the idea you can have trends and counter trends even happening within one very genre. It is important therefore that you catch these waves as a writer. And the good news is People always ask me, yeah, but it takes time to write a book, you know? Well, yes. And the good news is that book publishing and what's hot today in the book market is not going to be vanishing in three months' time. In fact, the book market waves do not represent those of the fashion industry where you have seasons and that's it. And the fashion changes basically by the quarter of the year. That doesn't happen in book publishing. So here, for example, we now extend the graph even further. We have now a 15 year timeline here. Google search interest for in yellow vampire romance, which started the whole thing, which then triggered overall interest in paranormal romance. And then out of Korea, you know, some five years ago, you have in, in Japanese and Korean manga comics and anime movies, you get this new thing like reverse harem, you know, where You have basically one girl and a whole couple of guys, and she cannot decide between them. In fact, she doesn't want to decide between them. A a trope, a certain theme that has been entering, has been picked up by urban fantasy and paranormal authors, and all of a sudden you have this new kid on the block. But you see, again, here it is years and years. And therefore, you know, really try to watch out in your publishing and writing efforts, what are these bigger trends, these bigger waves that are happening? And here's one of my favorite examples that goes back here all all the way to 2007, 2008, where you had the Twilight Saga, the individual books and movies, then followed already with a spin-off Vampire Diaries on television. See, six, seven years pass, and then come authors or say, ghost writing stables such as Bella Forest, pick it up, write a shade of vampire. I think by the, um, they rode the way for at least five, six years, if you look at the graph and you get the idea. Things, thank God, don't happen overnight. The first big lesson I learned from, from looking at book market trends is vampires never die. That's lesson one. And lesson two, neither do billionaires or do they? Well, I think uh, we won't belabor the point because... Jane was so kind to already uh, look at this research that we recently did on how Fifty Shades of Grey, which were like one-time events after the book, the the big blockbuster interest for the individual movies triggered a six, seven years to present time type of market for a whole genre, which then spread into all sorts of sub-tropes and sub-genres and character types, you name it. But it's not only happening in in romance, you can work with data in any genre. Take mystery thriller suspense. If you are a mystery thriller suspense over the last 10 years, if not longer, female protagonists, and by the way, female authors have really been crushing it. And that is reflected in the data. So here, for example, we track, we've been tracking the sales data of the category women sleuths in the mystery and thriller department of the Amazon Kindle store. And it's been a, a, it's in absolute terms already has always been a big market, but it's been trending up and up and up. And you get the idea, the, the, the trends happen and they're reflected in the data. That is what you should take away with. And there's also some cases where you have author-driven trends. I'm, I'm also often asked, hey, Alex, can authors develop trends, not just, you know, the big inter- entertainment industry? Well, yes, they can. Um, here you have the example of, of paranormal women's fiction where very successful authors from the urban fantasy, from the paranormal romance, from the women's fiction and mystery genres have coalesced and created 
for a specific target market of women age 40, 45, basically midlife and older, uh, these particular blends of the four genre, and they simply to find a, a whole home for its own, they, they labeled it paranormal women's fiction. A number of big name authors who started this probably about one and a half years ago, and especially the big name authors amongst it have been very successful with it. Then you have Netflix, of course. As an author and as a publisher, you have to watch Netflix. I mean, look at Netflix influence on the on books, for example, historical romance. Once Bridgerton came out over Christmas, this is on the left-hand side what happened immediately to the romance, historical romance category on the Amazon platform with the sales rank skyrocketing up and all of a sudden, all the people started reading historical Regency romance again. You get the idea. So lesson number one, apart from the vampire lesson, there are market forces at work. You can see them in the data. Thank God they, they don't happen overnight. And just a couple of tips for you to take away are, um, there is the Google Trends tool. It's very powerful when you know how to use it and how to read it. Um, Google News Alert. Do you have News Alert about your, you know, that trigger when something is published or there's a news article by some favorite authors of yours in a specific genre? Sometimes they, you know, are interviewed by big newspapers about upcoming projects, etc., uh, or about your genre when your genre is covered in, in big newspapers. Facebook groups, I think, are self-evident. Um, movie databases, as, as just said, very important. And also to watch uh, pre-orders. And of course, you can use Kalytics. But as we said, this is not meant to be a sales pitch. But we obviously do this for a living and, and try to do as much of the work for, for you. By the way, one tip on pre-orders, which I've recently done in these type of training sessions, because few people know about it, you can effectively look into the future on the Amazon Kindle platform because it offers a advanced search feature. It's often not legible because it's on the top right-hand corner of the screen and your screen needs to be big enough, your browser, so that you can actually see it. And when you do have it on, on screen, let me just um, go here to Amazon to, to show you. So there is this advanced search feature on the very right hand side which you can click on and it takes you to an advanced search screen which looks like this now what you can do and many people miss this you have here publication dates so you can see look for books that have been published before during or after a certain point in time so let's look at books that are will be published after this very point in time so after 2021 September, and let's say we want to specifically look for books that have to do with, um, say, paranormal with paranormal or PNR, paranormal romance, and we only want to look for this in the subject or in the category of romance. Now, once you click return, Amazon will present you in this case here with 300 results of upcoming new things for that search you just did. So that is all in the future. And you can already see, ah, here, paranormal women's fiction, another one, shift the romance, something with gods, you know. Of course, you have to browse through this, but with this tool, you can also, you can do this also for searches of individual authors, what they have in the pipeline, you name it. So also Amazon gives you here a little bit of a view into the future, um, even if you don't use any other sophisticated, say, uh, trend tools. So there are a couple of hacks that you can apply. I, in the end, in my childhood, when I didn't get one of these Rubik's Coop, this was then my hack in the end with when I couldn't solve it. So you see, there are always solutions. And in some cases, it's something like this. In other cases, like what I propose, it can be data and using the data in a smart way. All right, so we cover trends, but of course we also cannot ignore the current environment. And in the current environment, there, there has obviously been impact 
on the book market. Now, Jane and her newsletters obviously talked about this subject already various times. And I think overall, what we all took away is there, there has been tremendous good news, ironically, for, for our industry, the publishing industry, because it all started when we, when we go back in time to March, April 2020, we're here on, on Google search, you know, the, the search for coronavirus, you know, went off, you know, within a week's time. During one week later, the interest for ebooks now also here drawn on an overlaid on a different scale. Obviously, the absolute interest for information about the pandemic was bigger than that for ebooks. But within a week's time, within days' time, the interest for ebooks surged doubled by 100%. By the way, at the time when then the kids were all at home, the factor of interest for children's ebooks grew by a factor of 10 within a week. So there are these external factors. The I just want to spend like literally only less than a minute on the whole subject because the gist of it was the whole publishing industry after even after the high street bookshops were all closed, we all know that in the US the print book sales the trade print book, book sales closed with a growth of 8%, which I think was the highest growth in a decade. And I'm going to talk about Amazon in just a second, but there was a very, very good environment in the end, in hindsight, for books in general. And what I wanted to bring new into the equation was that, obviously, the whole thing, the pandemic, did have impact on various book genres in different ways. And just to bring the point across that the category data that we tracked here did show some of these effects here, the, the most obvious ones on the left-hand side, books for internal medicine, infectious disease, which were all the time nowhere in complete oblivion on the Amazon platform, all the way searched up into the top 10,000 of the Kindle store out of 8 million books by now, whilst uh, the poor travel books about Europe, Italy, and Florence, they just took this sharp dive and went into complete oblivion on Amazon. Good news, by the way, I just, this is the data up to March this year, I just checked. And um, if you look at my mouse here, the travel books for Florence are back up here at a sales rank level 200,000. So not stellar, but uh, the good news is trending up again. The point I'd wanted to make is there was impact and sometimes, it was very interesting for our Calytics authors to see and follow what was happening. That was one of the examples where things all of a sudden started to happen very fast and we were happy to, to be able to track things with the data month on month to, to see what's happening. One example here was as teens spent more time at home during the homeschooling, perhaps they read more again, but there's the pre-pandemic time for teen young adult paranormal urban fantasy romance. And there is the pandemic time. And you see almost like, like, like a trigger with the start of the pandemic, you know, this went, went up. And no, it was not just driven by Suzanne Collins bringing out a new book. In fact, it was a, a lot of also other books driving, driving up this upward motion. But the point is you have things with the pandemic that happened more quick, quick, more quickly than, than during other times of the year. And also overall, we had uh, more reader preference for humor, lighter reads, escapism, um, take the whole fantasy genre as a whole, where you had all of a sudden sci-fi and fantasy, especially the fantasy side of things, grow all the way up again as readers really wanted to um, get away from the dire news out there. And you could really see it because on the other end of the spectrum, this is here all the data up to the present time. This is mystery, thriller, suspense, horror. People are not interested right now to read more horror than is already out there in the world. And by the same token, although it's also influenced by big long-term hypes such as Walking Dead obviously dying off, um, this is the downward trend for dystopian post-apocalyptic fiction. We're in the dark gray shaded area here. Um, it really took a dive. But this, for example, is an example where you could sense some 
downward trend already before the pandemic hit. But what we also observed quite a bit is that the pandemic almost served as an accelerator to sometimes amplify trends that were already there. Jane, you were just coming live here. Yes, there there happened to be a question that came in that kind of ties into what you've been discussing. So I thought I, I would go ahead and ask it since it's on topic. Absolutely. Um, Liz says she's heard that dystopian in YA has declined, and she's thinking here of things like Hunger Games, Divergent, um, but that it's selling in adult fiction. That aside, whether that's true or not, she's also curious, just would Kalytics be able to help a writer choose between YA and adult if they, they know the plot they want to write, but they want to make sure they're heading to the right subgenre? Um, absolutely. I mean, perhaps later in the Q&A, we might even have a look at this very example because there is, we, we track probably, what is it, 100 teen young adult categories. And then if you confine it to say more, well, there are many, um, say, fantasy related ones, especially teen young adult has lots of sales data to offer. There is then the corresponding one. And here, it uh, there is also a corresponding, by the way, teen young adult dystopian one. So one could contrast the two. The one has different sales from the other. And, um, and you also see, by the way, some teen young adult fantasy authors going in slightly different areas where people, you know, what's been trending up, unlike the Hunger Games type of things, you all of a sudden have romantic fantasy or fantasy romance. Whoa, you know, the big thing right now, and it has been for the last 12 months or so, so uh, this is another, and thanks for this great question, because it show, shows that you can use data and inform your decision-making uh, where you don't have to say, I'm, I'm a writer of this and I, oh my God, now I have to write cowboy romance and I don't even ride a horse, you know? That is not meant by what we want to do, but to, and of course, there are these big decisions at point in times of your careers to be made. But there's also many like tuning decisions and you will later see in the presentation all the way down to, um, okay, shall my character be now a half god or a shapeshifter or a wolf? What's currently selling? And the sales are very much different for different character types. And that is then tuning in almost your instrument, your guitar tunes in to what the type of sound that that the audience currently wants to hear what's trendy. Excellent. Thank you. All right. And to close off, you know, this, this little assessment of what's been happening in our environment, last thing here, and this is very much what we focus on, the Amazon ebook market as one big indicator market. And if you within that market take, by the way, Kindle the Kindle Select Global Fund, which is a fancy word for all the royalties being paid to authors under the Kindle Unlimited scheme who chose to go exclusive with Amazon. So where you, where you also for, take part of the borrowing scheme and people borrow your book and you're paid by the page. Now that global fund, this is what it did since the year 2014 on the very left-hand side. During the year, main year of the pandemic, year one, 2020, it closed with 25% growth. And we've been tracking it every month. It, they publish the numbers. And if we make a projection on what the first half year represented in all the previous years, we can all already pretty safely say that we have a very, very healthy double digit, double digit growth to come. So I think I'll use one last time here, the picture I showed uh, already a while ago, a very touchy subject, but does the book market need a vaccine or not? Hell no, it's been really thriving and Amazon was really not gotten by, by this uh, little bastard. Anyway, more market forces to consider. There are a couple of trends that have nothing to do with the pandemic and there it already gets a bit more tactical in, in your marketing and in your writing. It's what I call market forces, or you could almost call them, I, I almost call them like gravitational forces in the, in the book market. What do I mean by that? Now that is, I'm not an astronaut nor an astronomer, but this is a, an image I think of a black hole. And the black hole is that, that infinite mass that sucks everything that nears the black hole. And sometimes I feel the Amazon algorithm is working in a very similar way where you have to be aware of certain forces that are almost like a self-fulfilling 
prophecy where things that are strong, they tend to get stronger in the book market. And that's something you can use to your advantage. One thing, for example, is that very share of books that are distributed via the, via the pay per page distribution scheme, Kindle Unlimited, where the share of books across all the main bestseller lists that we've been tracking has been growing from 44% on the left-hand side in 2016 to by the end of 2020 to 56%. Now, if you took and if you weighted that by the potential level of sales related to the sales ranks involved of these books, you could even argue that the share has become even higher. But this is not to say that you have to enroll with this program or not with a program. It is there to tell you that there are forces at work you just have to be aware of. For example, that if Amazon presents a book to you, a Kindle Unlimited download is presented to you as a read for free. Yes, you pay your monthly subscription, but psychologically, oh, I have the subscription, I just download this. So it's like a free free ebook button. And on the left-hand side, you may have a traditional published ebook with $14.499. Now from a marketeer's perspective, which, which button is going to convert at a higher rate? Well, of course the right-hand button is, and the irony, though, is although the right-hand button is sort of for free in inverted commas, both drive sales rank. So the book sales, the book sales rank will go up, will improve when people download the book and not even buy it. So it isn't a, a difference in waiting. So just this is getting already like a big into into the weeds. But just to give you some notion, another one perhaps a bit easier to understand is the importance of series. Now that you have to basically advertise to get noticed, it's sometimes hard to earn a return on just a single book. At the same time, it seems series seem to convert very well. And you have here the share of series in the rankings rising from 21% to 25%. Now, 1% not notch per year may not seem a big number to you, but I can tell you if Coca-Cola wins 1% of market share against Pepsi, that is a big thing in a year. And so here, if an evolution goes into one direction, it is something to be noticed. And in some genres, by the way, you can distinguish this by genre. If you look at things like sci-fi and fantasy, the top 100, already more than 60% of the books are part of the series. Now, these are just the main genres listed here that we track in the data. But if you go down to the next level, in Cozy Mystery, the number could easily be 70, if not 80% or more. And another fun example is the gravity, the gravitational force of so, so, uh, cover cliches. So you have certain cliches, take here the dark silhouette from behind or behind or front, I don't know. But the dark silhouette, it's not only used in, in horror, it is widely used in mystery thriller suspense, especially, especially in the Jack Reacher type of genre. So if you hear this from our report on vigilante justice fiction, the gravitational forces around copying cover art that works and just making it better instead of saying, I want a red cover has, has taken a, an importance where basically the whole market is defined by three cover types, nothing else that sells. So there's the dark persons with a dark back, there's persons in some other shape or form in a specific style, or there's a symbol type of use with big fonts and symbols like a military symbol, you name it, if it's more military type of vigilante justice fiction. And here, it's, it's just amazing. We've just um, done this for paranormal romance. You can even drive this down to the color schemes because every single book comes with data attached, which we're gonna cover in a second, which is the Amazon data essentials. And once you know what exists for one book, you can at least imagine that it can be aggregated, summed up or averaged for thousands of books. And that is how you get these trend lines and how you get these analysis. But in order to understand it, let me just reiterate very briefly for those of you who are new to this, just some basics that sometimes even the more advanced authors on Amazon miss. First of all, where do you look for data? Very simply, once you are in the Kindle store, there are 
many places of data, but there are four you want to be particularly aware of. One is obviously the search at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top. Whatever you type into the search, you get suggestions for related searches, which ties into keywords. You get then re search results, which show you, okay, what seems to convert because Amazon will show you what they can earn money with. Then there are the bestseller lists in blue. Now the bestseller lists, they are updated every two hours, I think in, in, in the high selling ones, even hourly. And there you have to note, they are great information. We use them a lot because they show actual sales rank and sales rank is solely driven as we covered before by sales or downloads. So it's really a direct measure. No reviews, no other factors go into whether you're listed up or down in a, in a bestseller list. It is very direct a measure. The downside though, at any point in time, it only shows you the top 100 of a given, uh, of a given category. Not so on the left-hand side, the browse categories, there you can also browse into like the same hierarchy, almost like the, like the bestseller lists. There, Amazon shows you virtually all the books. So it's not limited for the amount of books, but they are not presented in the search order. And very often when you type in a search such as paranormal romance or whatever you type, you're presented with many books that may not have to do something with the, with the genre. So you have to do more filtering yourself. And then there's the very book product page itself. And that is something important to understand. And I consciously took here an older image of a book product page. The information is still there, but it's not as nicely explained anymore by Amazon. Now you have, if you scroll down on any book page, you have two very important numbers. The one is this Amazon bestsellers rank, in this case, 25,000 something. And you have what's called a bestseller, a category bestseller rank. And people, beginners as advanced people sometimes confuse this because the important number is the upper number, the Amazon bestsellers rank. Why? Because that indicates a relative level of sales, like a real level of sales, but relative to what? Relative to all the other 8 million books that are on the Kindle store. That means the number one is really the number one store wide. And the number 8 million is really in the tail end. Now the category bestseller rank in this case here, it says rank number four in the Kindle store, blah, 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 in walking or in camping. That only means this is a hot book within that very category, within that subgenre. And this is an, an important distinction you have to make because often you see in Facebook groups, hey, I'm the number one in blah, 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 blah category. And that doesn't mean anything because you really have to be aware of bestsellers that do not sell because if you're the number one in a very obscure knitting pattern category, that's great to boast towards your family or family members that you're a number one bestseller, but you may be that number one bestseller with an overall sales rank of, you know, worse than 50,000 on the Kindle store. So beware of that distinction. And what we're interested in is in fact, that store bestseller rank. And many people don't understand how it works. So let me take 30 seconds to explain it to, to you. Amazon bestseller rank, very plain and simple. It is like a, I, I'd call it like a, like a voting mechanism. So we had this little buy or borrow button before. And let's say we plot here a period of 11 days. And on day one, 100 copies were downloaded or bought. And on day three, 150 copies of that very book were downloaded and bought. Now let's consider those purchases or downloads like votes. Now these votes, they work like in real politics, they decay over time. So if you on day one sold a hundred copies and let's say that's worth a hundred points in a scoring system, on day two, they these points are gonna be only half left, 50, and then 25, and half of it, and half of it. And the 150 on day three is also going to deteriorate by half over time. We, we, we measured this, and, and 
the result is that in this very case, on the day three, Amazon would count all the points, you know, the leftovers from earlier purchases and more weighted the ones that were closer to present time. And in this case, this green book has 175 votes, the 150 from the day three, plus the one what's left from the initial 100, in this case, 25 votes left. And then it compares that set of votes at that point in time to all the other 8 million book. And in this case, it is the number two. And this makes your statistics on Amazon go up and down. So this is like a real-time plot here, an hourly plot of a book's sales rank, where whenever something happens where somebody, you know, a family member buys the book, the sales rank goes up and then it deteriorates literally by the hour. And then somebody purchases it and it deteriorates literally by the hour. This here over 30 days and every little red dot is an hourly plot. So the purchase and, and downloads are like votes that count towards a ranking, but they decay over time. And therefore, it is important that you look at the market, not just as a point in time, because somebody may look at a bestseller list, you browse Amazon and say, oh my God, this book is hot right now. And you decide to write that type of book. But three hours later, it, it's, it's gone back into oblivion. So it is important to look at things over time. And that is exactly what we do with our Calytics data, because we would basically say for a whole category, what is the average you know, over a whole number of day, days ironing out those peaks and valleys of performance so that you have a meaningful indicator of whether, like the question we had before, that certain teen young adult category or subgenre is doing better or worse than anything else compared to it. So much for the basics, very important. And just to leave you one last concept that you understand the data that we also now look at in more detail is what you if you have data for one book, you can basically put the data together for any group of books. Now that that Grouping can be a category. It can be for certain search results. For example, what are the sales of books for the mating behavior of Chinese vineyard snails on Amazon? Any topic you want, or for any other custom grouping where you'd say, well, well, let's look at the sales rank of female protagonist books versus male protagonist books. Or let's look at the sales rank of shapeshifters versus um, aliens in science fiction, in, in, in paranormal romance or sci-fi romance for that matter. All right, so with this, what do you do with it in practice, right? Now, you can use this strategically to your advantage as a publisher or as an indie publisher or a traditional one, because it gives you vital data on, on you know, well, what is faring better than other things. Um, and you can use it really for the nitty gritty of where to, in, in what shelf to put your book in the upload board of KDP, the KDP dashboard. Let's look at some of the more strategic things to begin, begin with. You remember that cogwheel image from the start of the presentation. Now, some things happen before you even write or while you write. And these things are okay. If, if I want to sit down and publish or write, um, tell me, where are the high sales? Now, if you have the data for one book, we aggregate the data for you for many books and average out those performance fluctuations over time. So that we can very safely say for right now, the, the, the big sales on Amazon happen basically in three, four genres, romance, mystery, thriller, suspense, sci-fi and fantasy, bit of nonfiction, and then teen, young adult, then even uh, still pretty high children's books, probably due to the pandemic, it was lower before. And then it becomes pretty niche fairly quickly. So that would be the helicopter image. And in the data we track, you can then say, okay, yeah, but then within teen young adult, what would be the sequence there? Or overall, um, if we just dove to the, to the next level of detail, any category such as romance would break down further into subcategories. So you can take the sales to the next level. So if we just do this across all categories, you immediately see in the data that things like women fiction do very well at the top, um, contemporary romance of all shapes and form, all of the big 
MTS, mystery thriller, suspense subgenres, um, romantic comedy, you, may, you name it, lots of romance even happening at that level as you go down the list. So high sales is one thing. And just to show you, we had the question earlier um, in, in our tool for teen young adults. So if you have like 7,000 categories on Amazon and you then say, okay, what's happening just in say teen young adult as an example. So let me just click on teen young adult in our monthly updated database. And then you can see in teen young adult alone because it mixes fiction and nonfiction. There are, if I count this on the screen, 300 sub, 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 sub categories for which you can look up the sales data. So in this case, you know, we would then simply sort it in ascending order of sales rank, and we could potentially come back in the Q&A to that one teen young adult question that we had earlier. So one thing is high sales. You, you may want to aim at strategically, but the other thing you may want to look at is the degree of competition that you're facing. Because the reality of the market is that your challenge is uh, the market has become a crowded place. Kindle has been in place for more than 10 years. We have, by now, we counted 8.6 million books that we have on the Amazon Kindle platform. That is English books only here, by the way, and .com. We have 100,000, can you imagine, there is 100,000 new titles added every month to the library, to the to the platform. And that means the supply of books has been growing by another 20% per year. Now, this year was a great year also from a demand perspective. So demand is also growing very fast, but you see there is a lot of competition out there. And that means that sometimes you may feel a bit like at the gambling table when you think about your next book project as an author or publisher, where you go like, oh my God, you know, I throw this into the market has this idea legs. Well, what would we do, and my philosophy is your, your creativity is not limited, right? So opportunities abound. You can write in any genre. You can, I, I think if you just took genre times basic story arch, arcs times character times locations, all, already that mathematical equation would give you already a infinite amount of stories. That's why books have been around, I think, for so long in storytelling. But if you make, say, more economical choices, and you said, I have the choice between two stars on the sky, and every star is an idea of yours or a book genre, let's compare here the yellow star with the red star. You could, you, you could conceive a map to the stars if you're an astronaut where you simply say, okay, I want to sort all the stars in a way where the higher the star is above the horizon vertically, the more money is to be made on that star, the more whatever gold is on that star to be found. But the further you travel to the right of the horizon, the more competitors you, contenders you have that want to go after that money. So on this picture, if you had to make a choice between the yellow star and the red star, your choice would clearly be the yellow one. Why? Because it's higher up on top of the horizon. So more money to be made. And it's further to the left, meaning it is less crowded. And once you know this, up is good and to the right is more competitive, you get the following type of map, which we call the Kalytics book strategy map, where it plots all those 7,000 categories and every little dot is, is a category that has a position alongside the horizon. So the further up it is over the horizon, the better the Amazon sales rank, the more money is to be made. The further it travels or is from the left to right, the higher the level of competition as measured by the number of English speaking titles that are at the moment in that category. Let's look at an example here, how you would interpret this. So in this case, you could look at the data and say, hey, 
There is this huge market on the top right, mystery, thriller, suspense, thrillers. I'm gonna write thrillers. You may, but obviously you're in competition with all the traditional publishers out there with another 125,000 books, albeit the sales rank is stellar. You could say, well, how about writing teen young adult romance and particularly clean and wholesome one? Well, the sales rank is lower, so less money to be made. But at the point in time, there were only 450 titles, a fraction in the very category. Or you'd say, I'm going to be the number one writer for country and folk music biographies and memoirs. No sales to be made, but an easy number one bestseller because you have only 28 titles in the category. So this gives you a bit of, a, of the map. You can then you know, zero down on such a thing just into one specific genre here, just one example. Let me give you a couple. So this would be romance, again, from bottom to top right. Um, you could draw the same thing for basically anyone, and we do that in our reports. And then, as said before, again, you can look at certain things that happen over time. Let, let's take another one here. Just um, let's look into um, sci-fi and fantasy. We talked about um, post-apocalyptic having been trending down. So you see it gets closer to the orange area, but that does not mean it's dead. You see, it's still there in the green area. Green is good, orange is so-so, and red is not so good. So if you are into um, literary criticism, subjects and themes, sci-fi and fantasy, no surprise, not much competition, but it's a complete non-seller. And, you can obviously also dive deeper and look at some of this over time. For example, we often show this one. There was a bit of a debate. Well, if I'm in a romance, shall I write on the on the steamy side of things or even write erotica? Um, or shall I go more for the clean and wholesome type of things? I know many authors don't like uh, the term clean romance because it would infer anything else is dirty. So... I'm not into moral standards here. It's just what Amazon chose to be the terminology on their sales page, clean and wholesome. So it, it, it is what it is. But what's important is the sales data trend. This is over five years where we saw a big increase. And by the way, here you see the, the inspirational, clean, wholesome romance was extremely resilient to whatever happened during the gray, dark, gray, shaded area, the pandemic time. But it's a trend that started already before. Um, the steamier side of things were on a slight decline and uh, lower ranking in absolute terms. Now, that is the erotica category. And mind you, that is the one where you also face advertising restrictions. So that's been affected. But also, this one has been going up again a little. So, of course, steamy romance sells like crazy still. But it gives you a notion of, ah, there is decisions to be made. And I can look at the data and level of competition if you were to make a choice. And no surprise, we had things like in the billionaire romance report that Jane mentioned earlier that we recently did, the billionaire romance one, which started with Fifty Shades of Grey, the, you know, the really steamy side of things. Well, guess what? You now have clean billionaire romance in the bestseller list as well. So to a degree that we, we talked to some authors where we, where you had people who totally came from the steamy side of things. They recognized there is so much competition out there. They have to target new readers and they were adapting their stories left, right, and center to, to, to sanitize them of, you know, uh, two hot themes to make them palatable for different readerships. All right, so this is what you can do with category data. Um, that we just had a look at here. And as said, the one thing you just to recap is the one thing you want to look at is 
the level of sales that are happening across categories. And the other one is the con competitive intensity, like the number of titles. And just to give you the spectrum, if I sorted this here in our database from the largest number of titles at the top here, you know, and this is just teen young adult here now as an example, because we set that filter to teen young adult here. So the largest one would unsurprisingly be the umbrella category, teen young adult literature and fiction with 77,000 titles uh, in it, followed by fiction, uh, science fiction, fantasy. So that's, you already see where a lot of book titles are being published. But if I go to the other end of the spectrum and scroll all the way down, you have teen young adult categories, obviously often also in the nonfiction realm. So you have to filter that out that are very, very small in size, you know, even surprisingly, even like with the big themes over the last years, like LGBT, there is a LGBT teen young adult nonfiction books, 80 books in the category. So um, there are very small ones also in some of the literature and fiction available. So if you want to say, I just want to start out writing, but avoid the head on competition, um, there is trial ground to be made. And many t advanced teen young adult authors also, by the way, use these smaller categories for their um, tactical book placements. All right, so back into the data and with this, you can also say, okay, categories are only one part of the equation. And I totally agree because the, the, the categories, you also have things like category pollution. So where titles are in the, in the category that shouldn't be there in some categories, it's very bad. So a famous example would be mystery, thriller, suspense, crime, and then organized crime literature, or it wasn't thrillers, I don't remember. With the issue being it, it had a huge surge in sales, but the sales was entirely driven by the big and new kid on the block by mafia romance titles who put all their romance about mafia bosses into the organized crime category. So, but many ways lead to Rome, paths lead to Rome, because if you identify that trend, you basically look up and say, okay, what type of books drove the trend and say, okay, now I at least know it's not genuine organized crime literature, but it is this type of romance. And again, you have found something that others may not have found. Going beyond categories is a, another exercise you can, you can do and hear I think it's very hard to do it manually just browsing Amazon because what's behind this is you remember from earlier that every book comes with a bestseller rank, right? So that is a measure of sales or how, how well it does resonate with the readers. And every such book also has a book title and it has a book description. It has sometimes editorial reviews, sometimes very lengthy ones with lots of information in it. So you can look for particular words or phrases to appear in the titles and book descriptions. Sometimes it's, it's very easy. You say, okay, let's see how all the books do that mention, um, we are currently in the example of paranormal romance, that say mention shifters versus werewolves versus alphas versus mates versus omegas, you name it, there's an almost endless list of paranormal characters, male characters in that case. And you can aggregate the book data for each of these characters. And that's, that's what we then do in, in our genre reports where we zero in in the data just for a particular genre and, and dive deeper by doing this, this text mine and give you a tangible example would be, for example, here in, in, in um, epic fantasy, the subtitle here is, is wrong, sorry about that. But in epic fantasy, if you write this big 700 page book project, you may want to know while writing or even before that the mention of gods and goddesses and dragons and elves and dwarves is by far outselling any mention of guilds, elementals, goblins, and supernaturals, and even fays and fairies. So you, if you're a writer, I think you immediately get the idea where this is leading to, where you can adjust and tune in to what is resonating with the buyers. 
similar example here, this is now a vigilante justice fiction. So for those who don't know the genre, that's the Jack Reacher novels and uh, Lee Child started the big trend and so many have been jumping onto the bandwagon. Now, of course, in any of those at the very top of the list, you're gonna have a kill, an assassination, murder, crime. But then the next level of question, well, is the vigilante taking revenge or trying to clear up the disappearance or uh, the, the issue of a missing person? Or is he trying to get the, the, the person who plots this terror attack or does he pay just to, you know, try to bring to justice this drugs and narcotics boss or the conspiracy versus at the very bottom of the list, right? My God, things like rape and ritual murders, you know, which have been big perhaps six, seven years ago when we did a serial killer study, not so much anymore. And that is what we mean with using the data, Amazon data for text mining for what's selling within a genre, even down to, I wouldn't call it like, what are the highest selling trope that would, I would have to read every single book with my team. That's probably not the case, but you see how far the, the analytical part can be stretched. And we covered earlier the example of um, cover art. There's an example from romantic comedy. If you want to brief your cover designer, it is very useful to know whether it should be a flat vector graphic, which is currently the highest market share, the sexy guy on the cover, or the Mr. bottom right-hand side, just the Mr. Handsome. And the market clearly says, well, while, while you personally or your family member who looks at the cover suggestions may say, oh, the sexy couple, that's so cute, or the Mr. Handsome, so cute. Well, that's a matter of personal taste. But the overall picture is a matter of market research. And it basically says, if you're into romantic comedy, there are two cover types that sell, the flat vector and the sexy guy. So this is the text mining thing, and you can get very tactical. Um, we can you can ask questions such as well what is the distribution of prices given in a particular genre that we cover here's for example western romance where we look at well of the famous price points from 99 cents all the way up to you know in the one one dollar increments well if you look at more than seven thousand books in this case i think in this case yeah it was like seven thousand that made it into that virtual bestseller list that we created, there was clearly a most frequent price point, but also looking at the sales rank and from experience, the estimated sales that are behind sales rank, you could also argue there is a highest yielding price point and that was a dollar higher. So where you say, I, I trade some of the copies for a potentially higher yield, a higher royalty for it. So you see where this is going. And uh, we also look at things like you know top trending authors in the case of our urban fantasy study we've been doing this now for five years you you get a good list of author names who you can aspire to reach out for collaboration um you name it and you get a very clear picture of whether the genre is more geared towards traditional hybrid or or purely in the hands of the indies all right i think before we go into into the q a um, just some final words on um, how you can use this extremely tactically and then what we do uh, two, three minutes about Kalytics, Jane, if you don't mind. And then we have like ample time, 20 minutes or so for, for the questions and answers. The, the nitty gritty is where then people ask, well, in, into what books shall I place my category? This can get very tactical and um, category choice, by the way, is an important one, as are keywords, as are title power words and titles, as are power words and descriptions that we look at in our reports. Now, for a category choice, you have to think it this way. Amazon very much drives across its merchandise a category-based shopping experience, a search in category-based shopping experience. And think of the categories here, for example, in, in books, this is the, the print book aisle. At the very top, the first thing Amazon shows, hey, there's arts and photography, there's mystery suspense or romance, you know, go have a look. So they invite you like into a shopping aisle. If you publish a book, your book has to be in the right aisle. It's like you, if you sell washing powder and you sell at Walmart as a 
uh, as one distribution channel. If your washing powder happens to be in the aisle of the spaghettis and pasta, people won't find the washing powder you know, if they look for washing powder, you, you get the idea. And that is the same concept here. Now the store is a virtual one, which comes with a big advantage that it can place your, your merchandise into more than one aisle of the supermarket. And there can be conscious choices to be made that help, for example, with the achieving of that uh, famous or infamous orange bestseller badge. Because if you place the book into a pertinent, like a fitting category, but that happens to be one that is lowering competition and has a low, uh, a low, uh, what we track here, a low level of sales on average over time of the number one book title in the in the category, you see that the odds of achieving a, a bestseller badge can obviously be increased. Now, if you think that is only, um, it's only indies doing that well, uh, or small authors, you know, doing this. No, even the big names, even the big names are doing this because if you Google at any, or not Google, if you look on the shop at any point in time, that is, let's just see whether this, um, my hypothesis holds true here live. So let's go to the Kindle store, right? Um, Kindle. There we go, Kindle store, overall store entry point. So that's a person, what a person would see. And you search for Harry Potter. At any point in time, almost, Harry Potter is gonna show up with a number one bestseller tag, right? Now, in this case though, it's not that Harry Potter is necessarily always being the best in the big and competitive, in the big competitive category of uh, sci-fi and fantasy. No, if you look into it, Rowling and her team put the, if you then go to the bottom of the book page, it shows you in the product details, let me make this bigger here. Well, it's number one in three categories, but is it number one in the big fantasy high up competitive category? No, let's look at this bestseller list. Children's, orphans, and foster homes. So if you go into the bestseller list of children's growing up and facts of life, family life, so a sub, 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 sub category, orphans and foster homes, she put all her books in there. Why? Because at any point in time, this book in such an obscure category, and yeah, she may argue it, it fits because Harry Potter is an orphan, and it also doesn't say that this is only, uh, only nonfiction books. So you see, you can have a long debate and as if Ms. Rowling needed this, but with these books being put into this sub sub category, the odds are no matter who's leading the big sci-fi category at any point in time when a prospective buyer puts in Harry Potter books there will always be an orange bestseller badge, which then psychologically you will always as a potential customers jump at and click on it because it's that, wow, it's a bestseller, Let, let's check it out. You get the idea. And this can get so extreme that you sometimes even have categories that have not even a single title in the bestseller list. So just by placing your book into it, well, by now this example is probably gone, but here's South American travel. Uh, photography when I did this a while back, you know, sorry, there are no bestsellers available in this category, please check back later. Whoa, you know, uh, th this is, this is almost um, un unbelievable. But Amazon brings up new categories all the time. Sometimes they're very obscure, obscure, and you say, well, that's not fitting my book. But if you're a romance writer, for example, the data that we bring out uh, I think this in the next month for the first time, Amazon within the bestseller list, I don't know whether you noticed, but they did quite a number of changes in recent weeks in the bestseller list. So if you go into the Kindle bestseller lists, guess what? You, in the biggest and highest selling genre of Kindle eBooks, and by the way, they made sometimes now also a change where they sort this here almost by importance, but here it's now alphabetical. But if you go into romance, they just 
opened up in a completely new category, romance for later in life, right? So the silver seal romance and that sort of thing. It's immediately was captured by the way here by women's fiction type of authors. But if you go to the same category, not through the bestsellers, but through the browse categories in the Kindle store, I, I think last week there were less than a thousand titles in it. Compare that to a paranormal romance category that has more than 50,000 in there, um, you immediately get the idea. So this just to show you a bit the very tactical end that can you you can do with the data and um, this is very much you know what what my my passion is and what uh, my team and I look at to to summarize you know it has a lot to do with with okay how can I make better decisions and by the way before we get to the question I always get asked this question yes your Amazon if you upload your ebook the KDP dashboard only offers you two categories, right? But in many cases, these two categories won't match the category that you have on the storefront, on the Kindle store, where on the right-hand side, you have the Kindle storefront. It doesn't have anything to do with what the uh, upload dashboard offers you. Very simply solved you either go via Author Central on the left-hand side, there's support here, and there are the links in the screenshot. Or you go via KDP support, they even have like a pre-configured email form where you have to give them, that's the only thing because it's no longer displayed on the book, on the book pages per se, but where you basically have to tell them, okay, I want my book to be placed in whatever, teen young adult historical fiction, United States Civil War, and they will put the book for you into that very category that may you may have been missing from the upload dashboard. So in summary, if you want to put more market information into your writing, your publishing decisions or your writing project decisions, um, there's the term right to market, you could also call it market to market or publish to market. The essence is, if as a writer, you do this, you, you don't have to make this stunt. So it's not about, okay, you currently write cozy mystery and you want to go into BDSM erotica, into sadomasochistic erotica writing. That's not what you have to do. It's not about bending yourself. It is much more that you put into the equation three things from your side. First of all, what is the genre or genres you love to write or publish? What is the specific craft skill that you bring to the table to qualify for that genre? And what is the particular knowledge you have that you need to write with authenticity? So, well, you can't write legal thrillers if you don't know the legal system. And if you don't have any real good insights into how a Navy SEAL really lives, because your son is a Navy SEAL, you have no business writing Navy SEAL romance. You get the idea. And uh, I hopefully that, uh, that reflects the fact when I talk to the to big authors. But these are the top three things. Love, craft, and knowledge are the things you have to bring to the table. Um, the data part comes for the market and the marketing, that's the green zone. That's where I tried to bring some help. And um, there's no guarantee for success, but hopefully some magic happens where these things uh, basically come together. This is what we do. And um, as Jane mentioned, you can also access this at our uh, website. There you get all these market insights at your fingertips. In essence, there's two things that we offer um, in a package. The one is where there is this access to the database on the left-hand side. On the other, there's the access to all these individual genre reports, by the way, each of which is like a 70, 90 page PDF document that comes with full video like this teaching session here, this masterclass here. And with, with this, you can inform your, uh, inform your decision. If you'd like to find out more, you can ask me um, via email um, through this link here. By the way, we do have a, a current special for our highest level membership, which is the Calytics Elite membership, which gives you 
the annual price for with some six additional bonus months. And you can access this here um, for the next days on kalytics.com slash Jane. And um, happy to take questions. Happy to talk about your content uh, questions. And if you, if you want, you know, check out our site and get access to either the, um, the premium membership tier that we have, which basically gives you access to the database towards a depth of like 400 categories and many of these genre reports. If you want to go all the way, there is the elite level that also Jane is using where um, you get access to all those 7,000 categories, all the reports, all the videos, you name it. And especially in the videos, for example, we just published a paranormal romance um, study. There would then be for the elite members also like bonus bonus report just on shifters. So there, Elite just goes a little bit deeper, but premium already gets you very far. But as promised, this is not a sales session. We want to get your uh, questions answered. So I hope we, we got lots of them, Jane, and you know, let's spend the time solving as many as we can. And I'm also gonna be available to hopefully help beyond the, the live uh, recording of this. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, before I get into some of the content questions, just one question about Kalytics that has come up. People are wondering how it's different from Publisher Rocket. And, you know, my knowledge of this isn't particularly deep since I don't use Publisher Rocket myself, but my, I'll start with my impression and then you can correct me, Alex. I don't, sure. I think Publisher Rocket is just the data that you would use for categories and, and maybe advertising keywords. I don't think there are the reports, which is what I value a lot about what you're offering is that you're telling me category by category what's happening. I don't have to analyze it myself. So now I'll let you answer the question. Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, Publisher Rocket, and by the way, Dave Chesson is a, you know, uh, is someone I, I very much appreciate. We, we go back years and years. We've met many times and uh, Dave is a great, great guy. And so is his product. He comes very much to the equation from a software, uh, a tool perspective and a, a search optimization history that, that he has, right? So if, if you want to research 1000 keywords for an uh, Amazon advertising campaign, Publisher Rocket can extract those. It, it, it's a software tool, right? We do have an overlap perhaps in the area of categories a bit, but where we come into the game is basically our, our members area is like a repository of research already done for you. And of course you can go into the database and there the distinction is, is very clear. We look at the data over time. Rocket is like a real time tool for most of the part, you know, which which is great for speed. You know, you can just, what's happening on Amazon right now. I took more of the philosophy being a market researcher. I want to look at trends over time and average out these like hourly performance fluctuation, because if you don't know how to read the data, that, that can also lead you astray. And the other thing is I know many uh, authors and writers and publishers and editors are, are not necessarily maths people. So uh, I, I say, well, if you write paranormal romans, let's just take this one as an example. We have like 20 genre reports in the members area. And if you go into any of those, they stand alone would be like a complete seminar with a 90 page report just on paranormal romance. So yes, it is data driven, no doubt. So if I just, you know, you will probably go blind and unconscious if I just start scrolling through the pages of this report, but with a report, by the way, here's the cover analysis of, you know, which, which color, by the way, is selling the most in paranormal romance right now. Uh, my accounting teacher always said, there is no accounting for taste. My ambition was, yes, there is no accounting for taste, which is the sales ranks attached to specific colors and specific genres. That's the first time, by the way, we did this. So you see, there is a lot going on data-wise, but you're not alone because with the report comes a, you know, just on a click, you know, you hear me start talking. Alex Newton from Kalytics. Today with our ebook market research for paranormal romance genre. And, and here I stop. 
and there would be to follow like a 45 minute session like this one where I take you by the hand and through my take of the data and what, what it means. Excellent. All right, so the number one question of the session, uh, it, it's really three questions all pointing in the same direction. The nonfiction authors want some love. So they're wondering if you can speak in particular to trends in memoir. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also someone interested specifically in business. And I know you've done reports on these within the past uh, year or so. So any highlights you can share on those categories? Well, absolutely. I, I think, first of all, let me say, I started out Kalytics on the back of nonfiction. I, I grew up in the, in the very Kindle gold rush time, you know, where the question was, can you buy a house or Ferrari by publishing the paleo breakfast recipe book of your grandmother. <laughs> and my ingoing hypothesis was, yes, you can. But being a data person myself, I very quickly found out that, you know, if you go into nonfiction, um, first of all, all the categories that, that we looked at, they cover both fiction and nonfiction, right? But just for argument's sake, if we, if we say there, there are, by the way, many nonfiction categories, in fact, I think over the 7,000, guess estimate 3,000 would be nonfiction. So to give nonfiction authors some love, what, what, is, what is trending right now? If we only filtered for argument's sake on that one umbrella category of nonfiction, um, there are many nonfiction main categories. I don't know why Amazon does this, but they put law onto like level one, right? Which we know is not going to be selling great. But there's this nonfiction umbrella category, which encompasses then all other ones. And if we then said, let's sort this by ascending order of sales rank, just to get a bit of a feel, right? Obviously, we would get the big nonfiction categories at the top at like a, usually a subcategory level. So the big sellers would be unsurprisingly um, health, fitness, dieting, uh, biographies and memoirs, politics, social sciences, business and investing. And then the next interesting question is, well, if you then click to the next level down in business and investing, well, well what, is, what is trending there category wise? I think I should also be fair um, I haven't updated. We have a self-help and transformational skills report. We have a business and money one, a health fitness one. I haven't updated them for like a year and a half. And I will probably do towards the end of the year when people start doing their new year resolution mm -hmm. and, you know, planning ahead the next year. That's usually a better time I notice because if I show you the trend right now for self-help books into summer, even with the pandemic or now that everybody wants to get outside, you know, the sales trend is clearly diving down. That That's what's yeah. happening right now. Yeah, yeah. So I hope it gives a little bit of a taste at least. Yes. Um, here's a question that um, comes up frequently. People are wondering, can they access a definitive list of Amazon categories anywhere? Um, does that exist out in the wild? Um, yes, there are three sources. Um, Amazon does not offer it. Secondly, the list that does exist in the KDP dashboard um, does not reflect that storefront categorization that we have, right? I, I saw one or two Facebook groups where now one guy made an effort of like manually putting them all into a spreadsheet. And I think that's great. We, we've had it for the last six years. So any of these categories like here that you have, let, it, let me make it bigger, like a category path, we've been tracking it. Now, if you're an Amazon power seller, power affiliate, and you get access to their developer tools, there's something called the so-called browse nodes, and there's a table of them that is accessible. But the big issue you have with those self-made tables is, great then you have the name of the categories and that's great so they can probably do what we can do here if you want to write something about say adventure ikea and adventure and get a list of any category here it's just nonfiction, so that's a boring example it would only be four but if i clear the filter and say across all categories which ones have to do with adventure so let's do this 
um, you, you do get basically hundreds and hundreds of categories that have the very term adventure in it. Then you need to filter out the uh, children's books that you don't want to have in there. So yes, the one or other Facebook group may now have a spreadsheet that has this, but what do you do with just the name of the category? If you just have that one bonsai book and you need to find, and there is one Japanese gardening category, which you can easily find with this. But um, what I try to convey is the fun starts when you look is okay, which one is high selling, which is less competitive, okay. which has been trending up. That is where the fun starts. So um, the short answer is you may find the download in the one or other, if you Google like a lot of pages, there is the one or other guerrilla list out there. Um, the question is, is it up to date? And does it have any meaningful averaging out performance information about the categories? And there the answer will most probably be no in most cases. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Jean is wondering, as far as Kindle Unlimited, is are there particular genres that dominate there? Well, totally. Um, now, I don't want to belabor the point with the data. I, I, I showed you the overall Kindle Unlimited uh, graph, right? Now, if you take the overall Kindle Unlimited story to the next level, it is very clear that the share of books in the bestseller list that are in red, Kindle Unlimited versus non-Kindle Unlimited, already differ at the very top level, like in romance, I was very surprised here. This is, uh, by the way, from last year, um, fall. So it's not too old, right? 84% romance, Kindle Unlimited, teen young adult, Kindle Unlimited is the channel. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What we then do on top of uh, this analysis, which I do more on like conference level is in the nitty gritty here of the database, you see there's also in the columns where we, I hope it's legible on your screen. Let me try to make it a little bigger. So if I go to the um, right-hand side of the screen, there is a field which we call competitive intensity. Here it is, right? Competitive intensity. Now the competitive intensity would be the number of titles you have in that very category. And is it how much new supply do you get? But there is this one additional column where we, every month, we look at book by book, how many of the books are in KU versus not. Or not. So if I now sorted this in ascending order from smallest to largest, so you find here, um, and this was our adventure category. So there are adventure categories in comics and manga where only 6% of the books are in KU, but it goes all the way up to a K KU share here in erotica where it is closing in on 70%. So you see it again depends on very minute what genre you're talking about, whether Kindle Unlimited is the dominant channel or at least supply channel or not. And I think I'll make this the last question. Um, I think I know the answer, but I don't wanna presume. Do you assess what topics are being searched on that are underserved currently? Searched on, but under, uh, yeah. Well, f first of all, let me say, I, I try to stay out of predictions because <laughs> if, I, if, if I had the crystal ball, I would probably not be doing this webinar, right? <laughs> um, having said this, you know, sometimes we very successfully predicted things such as say the, the wholesome romance trend, uh, such as the vig vigilante justice trend, you know, where niche markets where people really started making really good money. Um, I've also done predictions on, oh my God, completely, I thought Shades of Grey would vanish, you know, as a book trend within months and it didn't. So here we go. That was a bad yeah. one. Um, so yes, especially when we dive into the individual jaw reports, we obviously, when we do this text mining, mm -hmm. you know, what type of tropes and characters are trending? Obviously we have to feed the system with some suggestions and they come from, uh, literally expanding all the Amazon search suggestions around a certain keyword. And um, so the, an the short answer is yes, but we try to stay out of this is going to be the next hit. Yeah. 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 Excellent. All right. Alex, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Just as a reminder to those who are still with us, this has been recorded 
And if you'd like to have another listen, look a little more closely at some of the slides that Alex was showing, you'll find the recording or the replay at my YouTube channel and you will receive an email with a link tomorrow. So um, just, you know, give us 24 hours to turn it around. So you've uh, the link, if you would like to go and sign up for Kalytics, uh, you saw the link, it's in the chat as well. And it will also be in the YouTube description if you wanna um, take them up on the offer tomorrow. And how good will that, will that link be good? How long will the offer be good? Just so people know. I don't know yet. I should usually okay. as a marketeer should say the next 48 <laughs> hours and there are only three <laughs> copies left. Uh, well, um, I, it, right now it, it will be, well, the super, the, the link will be valid, but this very special offer um, where we give you like six months for free on the elite annual package. That's going to be a time limit one. I think the timers right now are a typical seven day timer. Um, and by the way, even once it is over, if you have any questions about the content or the offer, here's also the email support at k-lytics.com. If you just put in the subject line, um, attention, Alex or webinar with Jane, um, it's going to be routed to me and I'll try to answer any question, whether content related or not, as best as I can. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Alex, and have a great day, everyone. Hope to see you in another session soon.